Okay, hello everybody. Welcome to the Fitness Education Online Podcast. I'm your host, Jono, and I'm super excited because we've got a absolute rock star on the line this week, also from Australia. A little bit about this person. He's a veteran in the fitness industry. He's got over 30 years experience. I think he started when he was five or, or something like that to get his, his 30 years experience. Uh, he's been a coach, he's been a trainer, an educator, a business owner, and I stumbled across him because he's the host of the Australian Fitness Podcast. And one of my friends was interviewed on there, the, the CEO of Exercise New Zealand, a heavy hitter. And he shared the episode. I was like, oh, I'll check out this podcast, see who's on it. And I checked out the guests. And he's just got like the biggest names in, in the Australian fitness industry. I saw the commando, Steve Willis has been interviewed on there. Uh, Craig Harper from the U Project, Sam Wood from The Bachelor, uh, Jeff Jowett from, from Body Trim. Like depending on how old you are, like you would just go through his list of guests and be like, I don't remember that when that person was hit it big. I know this person. Oh, that person's huge now. So anyways, without further ado, let me introduce the one and only Mr. Russell Jarrett. Russell, how are you? G'day, Jono. I'm well, and thanks for having me on the show, mate. It's great to be here and talk to you. No, I'm excited. Um, Russell, I like to start all my podcasts off with a quote or mantra that inspires you or fires you up. Have you got one for us? Yeah, well, I have. Um, my Mine's very simple, and, and it's just a few words, and that is life isn't a dress rehearsal. Mm. Uh, that's one that uh, I use quite frequently. Um, a lot of people have used it. I'm not. I'm not claiming that uh, <laughs> I created that one at all. But it. But it's true. I think it sums up a lot of things, isn't it? Like life is not a dress rehearsal, and an, and I think I've probably uh, replayed that over and over in my mind a few times in the last 12 to 14 months, just to keep my uh, sanity and keep me focused on the on the projects in you know at hand. Yes, love it. I, I like a similar one. I heard a similar one the other day. It was something along the lines of most people tiptoe safe, uh, tiptoe through life to make it safely to death. And it's sort of like, what's yeah. the point? You know, you only get one shot. You may as well, you know, take it. That's it. Make, so, a, make a statement and have a bit of an impact, huh? Love it. Well, Russell, what I'd love to, to talk to you about to start with anyway is your podcast. Like, I'm super curious, um, what made you want to get into it? How did you get it started? How did you get all these heavy hitters on there? What's the plans for it? Let, let me and your listeners know a little bit about your podcast. Right. Well, there's a story behind this and I'll, 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 I'll shed some light on it. So I'm, I'm, I'm good friends with a guy who's been part of the fitness industry for a long period of time, and that's Craig Harper. But he's, he's probably moved in a slightly different direction mm -hmm. over the last five to 10 years into a little bit more of the self-development space. Um, but we're good mates. We talk on a frequent basis. In fact, you know, almost weekly. Um, and Craig was saying to me a few years ago, he goes, mate, you, you should do a podcast. And he goes, lots of people are doing them. Um, you know, you, you're reasonably good with, with speaking and engaging with people. And he goes, as a matter of fact, he goes, I've got a podcast name that I don't want. I, I, I'm not going to use it. Uh, it's a little bit restrictive for what I want to do. So you can have it. And I said, what's the name? And he said, it's the Australian Fitness Podcast. So actually, Jono, the story is that the name and the podcast was Craig Harper's, but he, he really didn't do any, anything with it extensively because uh, by his own words, he felt that it was a little bit pigeonholed. It was a bit restrictive, right? But for me, because the fitness industry and training, physical performance and all of that sort of stuff is really my bread and butter. Um, I said, I'll take that and I'll run with it. What a great name. So he gave me the name and then I created the podcast back in 2018. Okay. Love There's it. There's the story. <laughs> awesome. And all the, all the heavy hitters on there, Russell, what, do you just reach out? Are they your friends as well? Like, I think your first episode was Sam Wood, right? Yeah. From I The Bachelor. I I think Sam was my first uh, episode and um, Sam is someone that I've worked with uh, when, when he first entered the fitness industry, he worked mm. for Craig. Um, he, he, Craig had a PT center, Sam worked for him. I had a business with Craig. So we were all involved with each other in some way, shape or form. So I, I I've known Sam for a long period of time. I, I guess, John, I, I kind of needed to create a little bit of um, awareness early. I, I, mm. I thought, you know, if I'm gonna if I'm gonna get some following, if I'm gonna get some um, some traction, I need to get some names that probably people are, are familiar with, mm. and that's why I went after Sam Wood. I, I went after Tony Doherty, 
who's massive in the Australian fitness industry. I think he was episode number two. Um, I went after, yeah, so it was a calculated strategy by me to reach out to people that I knew, um, that I knew also had a good profile, but also some respect within the industry as well. Yes, love it. Awesome. And I recommend everyone listening to this uh, podcast, go over and check out Russell's, the Australian Fitness Podcast. I'll put the links down in the show notes. There's a, I think the latest one was with a commando as well, right? Just the yeah, other day. I did a, I did a follow-up episode with Steve. Um, he was a little harder to get a hold of because I don't, yeah. I didn't know him, but you know, it's, it's, it's probably similar to what you do. You know, you, you, you look at people, you, you think, mm-hmm. hang on, they'd be interesting to talk to that. I'd be able to have a good conversation with them. And then it's, it's a case of reaching out. And that's the, you know, that's one of the benefits of social media mm-hmm. You know, people are people are reachable. I mean, mm-hmm. if you go back 10 years, if I wanted to talk to Steve 10 years ago, I would have had to have gone through his manager. Mm-hmm. I would have had to gone through a gatekeeper. I would have had to, you know, hope that someone who took his messages or or looked after his email was um, capable or, or, or at least um, prepared to, to contact him and reach out to him. Whereas I just I just went straight to him via social media and said, "This is who I am. This is what I do. Um, this is what I would like to do with you. I hope that that's okay. Let me know if that's something we can discuss." Blah blah blah. And um, yeah, I was lucky enough that he came back to me and he said, "Yep, um, I'm a bit busy, but when we've got time, let's do it." Love it, and I think it's a good message for a lot of the trainers listening as well. Like half it is just asking. Yeah. Right. If you never ask, you're you're never gonna you're never gonna get the sale or get the guest or or whatever it may be. So I think that's an important lesson. Yeah, um, you need you need you need to ask and you need to approach it um in the right manner. Mm. And you also need to be prepared that there's gonna be times where you won't be re recontacted, you won't get any noise back, you won't get that person as a guest, you know. It I don't I don't succeed in all of the contacts I reach out to. In fact. There's a guy that I've spoken to a couple of times in the U- in the US who I know would be an awesome guest, and we had everything lined up, and then the, and then it just went silent, mm-hmm. and so I haven't been able to reach him, and so you know I'm kind of sitting there in myself going, if I go, if I reach out again, that's probably five contacts I've made with this guy. It's starting to get a little bit annoying. Yeah. So you know it's it's tough. It's a balancing act, isn't it? Agree. Well, um, Russell, what I'd like to talk about today is just your opinion on, on the state of the fitness industry in a few different things, because you've been in there a long time, about 30, 30 years, I, I believe. And then all your guests have also been in there for a long time and, and they're the heavy hitters. So maybe let's start with the changes. I think that'll be a good one over the, the past 30 years. And let's go both ways. Let's say some things that you've, you've seen change for the better. And you're like, man, I wish this was around 30 years ago. But I'm sure there may be a couple of things the other way as well, where you're like, oh man, when did this come in and how do we get rid of it? What, what can you tell us there? What changes have you seen? Well, Jono, the, fir- the first thing that, that springs to my mind is the access and ease of access to information. Yeah. Now, now that, that in itself, we could talk about that you know, extensively, but Jono, for me, that, is, that has been both a positive and a negative depending on how you yeah. see it, how you use it, how you access it, what you do with it. Yeah. Um, you know, information in itself is not that valuable because mm. you can you can pick up um, you can pick up a phone, you can pick up a computer, you can you can go down a rabbit hole and and Google things and and just continue to dive deeper and deeper. Now, you know, if you knew nothing about the finer points of uh, let's say energy system training, right? Let's say that that was something that that your skill set wasn't great with. So you could deep dive into that, and you could find stacks of information. Mm. But that that information in itself is of no benefit to you unless you know what to do with it. Mm. So the positive, one of the positives is that there's so much information at the fingertips of all trainers these days that I really don't believe that any trainer who um, who operates should not understand at least the basics of all aspects of training and conditioning. You, sh- you should be across all aspects because it's there for you to, to find and look at. There's no excuse anymore, right? Back, no, in, back in the day, you would have had to, oh, let me wait till a lecturer comes and yep. let me fork out hundreds, if not thousands of dollars to do a weekend course. Still, obviously that stuff exists and that's important, but you, you maybe in those days you could have said, oh, I don't have 
this weekend free. You know, I'm overseas that weekend or a bit tight on cash, can't afford it. These days, you got no excuse. No, you got no excuse. Like I was, um, I was delivering a presentation a while back on speed training and I just wanted to refresh my memory about some of the things that are important in the development of speed training. So I jumped on the internet, I jumped on YouTube and within 15 minutes, I'd found three or four drills that I'd never seen before. Yeah. Now, I, I first spoke to a speed coach, an elite track and field coach, 25 years ago when I was um, really quite new to strength and conditioning. And I had to ring this guy. I had to find him. Then I had to go and meet him at an athletics track. I had to drive, I don't know, it would have been at least an hour to where he was training people. Then I had to spend a couple of hours with him. Then I had to, you know, then I had to put it all blah, blah, blah. So it took me probably 10 hours of work mm. to, to learn five drills. Yeah. Now it takes you 10 minutes of Googling to find five drills, yeah. right? But there's value, Jono, in what I did, what I did in, in, in going through all of that pain in the ass, mm. driving and, and find, there's value in that because mm. when he showed me those five to 10 drills, I still remember them yeah. because I had to work hard to actually get that information. Yeah. And, I, and I valued the process and I valued his time and I still know the guy and I still use his work because you, you paid, I had to pay a price to get that information. Does, does that make sense? Yeah. The, the, uh, the quote I like, the more you pay, the more you pay attention. And yes. I know it, so I'm in the online world, right? Some of the courses, so I've got some free courses as well. Hey, you want this thing? You know, go and do this free course. All the drill, all the boot camp games you need are in this free mini course here. Most people download it and don't even open it, right? I've also got another course, which is $500. It's like 100%. Whoever, whoever buys the 500 bucks, they go through it. And the info often isn't that different. It's just because I've paid, I'm not wasting my money. So I'm going to make sure I get every cent of it worth. And I think the other, the and, and that's the money side of things, but yours was also an effort as well. Man, yeah. if I'm going to get in the car and drive down and meet this person and do the cold call, I'm going to make sure that I get every, every, I'm not going to let this hard work go to waste. And I think the other, the other benefit of the way you did it as well, um, I guess that the down point, and I shouldn't say down point, but if we're thinking of it, maybe from a business side of things, the down point of the, the information being so easily accessible is okay. It's very easy for me to do it but it's also very easy for all my competitors to jump on on YouTube and do the same thing. But if you can go that extra, like in your case, most trainers probably wouldn't have done that, you know, yeah. because you did it. Okay. Here's where you are now. And you've been in the industry for so long and so successful. The people that didn't do it cause it's, cause it's um, uh, cause it was too hard. Maybe they're not in the industry anymore. They're not as successful. So I think that's the, uh, the other down point to it being so accessible is now everybody's got access to it. So yes, yeah. it's going to make you a better trainer, but you may need to do a little bit more as well because hey, you're better than you would have been before. Um, but that information is also accessible to other trainers and then also just the other general public. You know, maybe it's like, well, hold on, do I need a trainer if I can just YouTube this stuff myself? Yeah, exactly. Which brings me to, you know, listening to you there, that brings me to another thought. And that is what's, what's some of the changes that I've seen that are negative? Yeah. Well, some, some of those are the fact that information is so accessible that now, there's there's a lot of good content out there, but mm. there's also a lot of bad content or misinformation yeah. or, or sloppy content. Now, yeah. people that are consumers of that, if their general population, if they don't have the education and the the uh, technical understanding of what yeah. they're watching, listening, and learning about, they believe it to be true. Yeah. Now, it may it may well be true. It may not, or a version of it might be true. You know, components of it. So now you've got, you know, clients and, and customers that are constantly bombarded with more information, more content, more, more fads, more new ways, this diet, that diet, and then the other diet. And so I find as a coach, I spend a lot more of my time these days um, putting out spot fires and mm -hmm. trying to clean up people's um, thoughts and opinions on what is or what is not accurate that's I, I never used to have to do that but now mm. I, I find myself almost um i'm almost like an editor of information yeah. you know people yeah. come to me and go oh what about this what about that i go well uh there's parts of that that are true and there's parts that aren't 
I, do you remember maybe 12 months, two years ago, when they released the documentary um, about... Um, the vegan. What, yeah, the yeah, vegan. Yeah, what was yeah. that called? Game Changers or something? Game Changers. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. You know, and, and for the for the next month to six mm-hmm. weeks, everyone in my gym was talking about Game Changers. I'm like, hang on a minute. You've watched a two-hour documentary. <laughs> you know, there's 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 a lot more to it than that. So I, I had to spend spend my time really trying to um, convince people that, well, you can do that if you want, but, but don't think that it's going to totally turn your life around, mm. you know? I love it. Yeah. Well, I think you hit the nail on the head where I think that's a huge change. Like 10, 20 years ago, your job was probably more an educator. People are like, I have no idea. Let me go in with a blank mind where I know nothing and educate me. Now it's the opposite. Now it's like, man, I, I checked Facebook one day and this guy told me this. Then the next day they told me this. The next day they told me this. I've got all these thoughts going around my head. Russell, simplify or tell me which yeah. is for me or, or which isn't for me. Saying so that's a, a change. And I'll just piggyback off that as well. The other, I think there's two things. I think it's great as a trainer because you can you can jump on YouTube and you can figure out in about in a couple of minutes, does this guy know what he's talking about or are they full of crap? This yep. is pretty good. I'm going to follow this person and listen to him. This guy's got no idea I'm not. The general public doesn't know that, all right? So great for a trainer, general public, not so good. And the other thing is half of them are marketers. You know, half of the people putting the stuff on, some of them are just good educators. You know, let me just put good stuff on YouTube or Google to educate you. But some people are doing it just to make money. Okay, let me just put, let me, you know, manipulate the facts a little bit and give a little bit of information. But my whole purpose is not so much to educate this person, but to get this person to buy my product, right? And that's very tricky to see for a consumer. So I'm, I'm glad you, you brought that up there. You found that yourself? Oh, mate, all the time. I mean, yeah. you know, because, because my Instagram, um, you know, is, is fitness based. Um, my Facebook page is fit, fitness based, as is my website. I guess all of those clever algorithms out there are finding me and, and my mm. feed is con- constantly yeah. <laughs> with ads and marketers mm. and, you know, uh, wow. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm sure I'm not alone, but, but it's certainly at, at, at certain times it does force me to just, I just want to put the devices away. Mm. Yeah. Yep. Cool. Um, what I'd also like to talk about today, Russell is, the, I, you're in a very good position. You speak to all the, the heavy hitters. You've probably got a pretty good idea of where the industry is going. W- what can you tell us there from interview on all these heavy hitters? What direction can you see the next, you know, two to five years? Where do you see it going and, and how can a fitness professional prepare themselves for these changes? Yeah. Yeah. Look, John, it's, um, it's an interesting one because uh, I've spoken to a lot of people, as you say, that have got a, a pretty strong pedigree in the fitness mm-hmm. field over the last couple of years. And and I ask them the same question you've asked me. Um, look, the general consensus is that the fitness industry is in a good place. Um, we've still got a lot of work to do. Uh, obviously, we, still, we, we need to be a, a little bit more um, flexible and a little bit more open-minded than perhaps we've been in the mm-hmm. past because of the situation that's occurred in Australia and overseas and the the change in the landscape of life over the last 14 months, okay? So um, we definitely need to be a little bit more flexible than what we once were. Now, obviously, when when we were in full lockdown here in Victoria last year, uh, you know, a large part of the Victorian fitness industry had to go completely online. Yeah. Uh, whereas around Australia, they were most other states were out of lockdown. It was pretty much back to business as normal. Um, it certainly is, you know, Victoria. The fitness industry in Victoria is certainly different at the moment to what other states are. Um, there's a different feeling in the in the fitness industry here. There's still a lot of um, businesses that are um, rebuilding, are in a rebuilding phase. Um, I've even noticed a change in the training habits and the um, the rhythm of my gym. So there's people now that don't come at night anymore. They come in the morning, whereas they used to be nighttime exercises. Now they're morning exercises. So I think that there's lots of different things that are changing. I think that, yes, we do need to be uh, flexible. We do need to perhaps have online skills, online capabilities, online offerings. I believe that but I don't believe that that's everything now. Mm. Um, Most people that I've spoken to still tell me that their own gyms and their own businesses 
people are still coming back because they they need and they want that physical one-to-one or one-to-group connection. Mm. I don't think that's ever going to change. I hope it doesn't. Mm. Um, So, yeah, there's definitely an increased need for business flexibility and and business skill. I think that, you know, fitness professionals once upon a time used to be able to succeed by being a fitness professional. That's not enough anymore. You need to be a fitness professional but think like a business person yeah. and and your business is fitness and mm. you need to see it like that. Um, I think that's more important than ever before, Jono. Yeah, hundred percent. And it's like, and I'll ask a follow-up question with that, but yeah, it's like you used to be, and it's, it's almost sad in a way where you used to be able to just be good at what you did. You know, you could just be a good trainer and you'd be successful. But I guess, I think what changed there is just the level of competition. You know, it's just like now it's 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 pretty easy to become a personal trainer. And also like with all the online options, you probably don't even need to be a person. You can just look fit and, you know, uh, and make money on YouTube or, or Instagram. So I think because of that competition, you, you do need to be business savvy. Now, question here, Russell, answer this how you like. And there's probably not a perfect answer, but I'm just interested in your opinion. Following up or piggybacking from that, it's probably important for fitness professionals to upskill on both sides of things. Upskill on how can I be a better trainer? but how can I be a a business owner? Now, my personal space is usually when starting off in the industry, you're probably going to spend a bit more time on being a better trainer, you know, learning those skills there because it's sort of a base. But as you get on, you're probably going to, you're always going to have to upscale a little bit, but it's probably like, all right, right now I need to focus more on my business. What can you tell us there? Do you have any split ideas where it's like, hey, spend 50% of your time on fitness and 50 on business or, you know, more one way and more less way and it changes as you go or what can you tell us there? Yeah. Okay. So the way I would see it, Jono, is it, it also, it's also um, a little bit about what is your background as you come into the fitness industry. So me, my background was, I didn't, like I came in as a very young person, so I didn't have a business background. I'd never owned a business. So when I first started entering the industry as a trainer, um, for me, it was all about, I need to be the best trainer I can be. Mm. I need to make sure that Every client I deal with succeeds to a certain extent or, you know, succeeds completely in what their goals and aspirations are. Mm. Now, as I did that, as I got really good at being a a trainer and getting results with clients, I then started to turn my focus and attention to, well, I would like to actually own a business that does Mm. this so that I necessarily don't have to be on the floor from early until late. Mm. It's, a, it's, a, it's a fairly natural progression and transition, I believe. Yep. And so I had to learn business skills. And, um, and, to, and probably today, Jono, most of my development, my personal development, is learning more business skills than PT skills and training mm. skills. Because not that I know everything, but I've got mm. a pretty good um, bank of knowledge when it comes to training people. What? But the business side of it, still you know still grows right. and my my um my learning curve over the last 14 months has been enormous mm. because i've had to think about business differently mm. you know it's no longer so as a business owner now it's no longer about just opening the door to a gym and having people rock up mm. i'm i'm having to spend a lot more time on making sure that people have a reason to stay you know and also those that are not exercising in my gym at the moment that used to be, where are they? Mm. Where have they gone? How do I get them back? How do I change my business or change the operations of my business to make it, um, uh, you know, compulsive that people come back to me? Mm. So my development is, is much more a business. Now, how that applies to other people is very much dependent on their own individual situation. Uh. So I, I would say that, you know, generally speaking, if you're a young trainer and you're just starting out, I would be learning, you know, as much as I could about training people, getting mm. results, working mm. with different types of individuals, um, broadening your your skill set so that you can work with all sorts of people on all sorts of levels, so that you, you're opening up your field of potential client. Mm. That would be my advice. Um, however, if you feel like you're you're wanting to transition one day or soon into more of a business operation then you need to start turning your attention to development in that aspect. And is, you know, that might be getting a mentor. It might be doing a qualification or a certification 
Um, it might be going deeper than that and doing an MBA or something like that. But, um, you know, the beauty is uh, everyone, no matter where they are in, in whatever stage of their career, can, can learn more and, and should learn more. Anyone I've spoken to who is good at what they do will say to me, you've got to be constantly learning new stuff. Mm, 100%. I'm a huge Tony Robbins fan. And he's yeah. got this um this quote something along the lines of you're either um you're either green and growing or you're you're ripe and rotting. There's no there's no steady, especially not in the fitness industry. If you just think right, I think I know it all in either training or business. Don't need to do anything else. You're not going to stay the same. You're going to keep dropping down, 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 down because there's people doing the jump. So I'm glad yeah. you brought that up. I want to highlight um, a couple of things you mentioned. And one thing I think I heard it on your podcast with the commando easier earlier, I think it was either you or him that said it, was something along the lines of, hey, if I can make myself redundant as a personal trainer, I've done a good job. And I love that mindset. I think that, and it, it's it's an abundance versus scarcity. You know, if you go in there as a trainer and you're like, you know what, I'm going to hold back a little bit because if I teach this, this client too much, then they're not going to train with me. I feel you're not doing your job as a trainer, but I feel if you go into it and it's like, hey, my whole job is to make, make my, myself redundant. If I can get this person to train without me, I've done a good job. And most of the times it probably won't even happen because you're going to keep upskilling and they're going to keep up. They're going to keep wanting more and more and more. So it probably won't happen, but it's, a, it's just a good way to look at it. So I wanted to highlight that there. Um, and I also wanted to highlight a couple other things you said around thinking like a business owner. So I think that's important because you said it's a natural progression. I think a lot of people don't think like that. It's just like, right, I just want to be a busy PT. I want to have 20, 25, 35 clients and be busy and, you know, make a couple of thousand dollars a, a week and then I'm happy. You know, I live a good life. But there's so many downfalls to that, you know, you can't take a sick day, you can't take a holiday, you can't take a week off, you know, you don't work, you, you don't get paid. So I think it's important to, for the listeners just to be like, oh, okay, so there are ways around it, you know, I can, I don't have to just trade money for time. So I think that's important. And then the other thing you said about, you know, training a wide variety of people, I think that's super important, especially at the start for two reasons. Then I think you've got the skill set to train a wide variety of people, but also maybe you don't want to, but at least you've tried a few and you know, maybe you're like, Hey, I've trained, you know, every single type of people out there. I only like training mums. I yeah. only like training athletes. I only like training bodybuilders I only whatever it may be. And then you can niche down from there, but it's so much easier to niche down if you've tried them all and decided what you like and you don't like, than just trying to pick something out from the air. Um, any thoughts on those, Russell? Yeah, so I, I agree. I mean, you know, in the early days, I was very much of that mindset. I uh, I was prepared to train anyone, anywhere, at any time. And, mm. you know, Craig, when when I first started working with Craig, that was his advice to me. Yeah. It's like, mate, just, just be a good trainer to anyone who walks through the door. Um, because initially, you, you need to grow that client base. You need to grow that, uh, that database. And you've got the energy as well, you know. Um, as a 25-year-old, when I first sort of kicked off, mm. um, I had the energy to work long, mm. long hours and I didn't have family commitments. I didn't have huge financial commitments. So I could, I could do that. But you, 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 have to, you have to future-proof. You have to mm. look forward, I believe, because if you don't, then pretty much, you, get, you know, five years is going to go past, 10 years is going to go past, mm. And you're going to kind of be in the same position. Now, yeah. that might be fine. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that. But if you feel like there's going to be a transition in your career, then you need to plan for that. Otherwise, time will just tick on by, mate. Um, but, yeah, I, I, you know, these days I find, uh, and it's because of my age and my, my um, demographic, you know, I'm 53, I find that I, I work best nowadays with, males that are probably over the age of 40. Mm -hmm. um, I can still train females of most ages. I can still train young males. Um, but uh, the, the problem is that they don't really identify with me. Yeah. You know, so a 20-year-old male who wants to get, you know, muscular and, and really whack on some serious muscle, they're not going to identify with me. They're going to identify with a bigger, younger guy who's probably a bodybuilder or a strength athlete who kind of looks the part, you know? Yeah. Um, and that's not, there's nothing wrong with that. That's just human. That's the human condition. Yeah. 
we're attracted to people of, of similar likes and abilities. That's normal. So um, most people that feel like they're going to be able to connect with me and work with me are males over the age of 40. Mm. And so that's kind of most of my clientele. Does that make sense? Yeah, 100%. Agree. Awesome. All right. Russell, there's a couple questions I always like to, to finish up with. The first one is the different question. So you've been in the industry a long time, obviously done a lot of things right, maybe done a lot of things not, not great as well. If there was one thing that you could go, do differently, you can go back in time and speak to your 25-year-old your self starting off, you'd be like, hey, Russell, remember when you did this? You should have done this and you would be way further ahead here. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think, I, think, I think the answer to that is, is kind of along the lines of what I've just said. I, I, spent, I think I spent too long initially not, um, thinking forward and, pl and planning mm. what my next stage was. You know, I could, I probably worked pretty hard from the age of 25 to 40, um, you know, working hard, training people, um, training athletes, working with teams, but not really thinking about what's the next step and where's my next level of progression. Um, and I've really focused on that between the ages of 40 and 50. So that's when I really said, right, this is the bracket where I need to think like a businessman. I need to own a business, operate a business, create some kind of saleable uh, entity as well, you know, yeah. and, and my business that I operate doesn't rely on me. It relies on part of what I do, but it doesn't rely on me uh, entirely. So that, you know, and you know what, that, that means that it's a saleable business. If I ever want to sell it, you know, I, I can do that. That's the other thing I think would be the piece of advice. If you if you just train clients, you don't really have a business. You yeah. don't have a business to sell mm. because people train with you. Yeah. So if, if Jono has 30 clients and Jono decides to retire and become a tradesy, like an electrician, right? Yeah. Well, you can't sell those 30 clients to anyone. I'm selling email addresses, right? I'm yeah, selling. that's it. That's yeah. it. You're yeah. selling a database. So... Yeah. You know, you could you could convince someone that that's worth, I don't know, a thousand dollars, five thousand yeah. dollars, but good luck, you yeah. know. And, and even, it, but even that, even if you've put in years and years of work and hours and studying and early mornings and late nights to sell your database for a thousand bucks, you know. Yeah, yeah, for a thousand bucks. That's yeah. right. Yeah. So that's the one. You know, it's not a, it's not a, um, it, it's not a problem necessarily. It's just a fact. We yeah. we. It's like a hairdresser. It's like any appointment-based business. Yeah. You really don't have a business unless you can build it to the point where it doesn't need you. Mm. Then you've got a business you can sell. Does that, that make sense? Love it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I've got a follow-up question, but I'll just piggyback on that a little bit. And I think even the way I heard it explained to me is even if you don't want to sell it, it's still a good thing to build your business like that. Even if Absolutely. you have no intentions of selling it, it just runs better as a business if you're not there. And, and you can still be there. Yeah. You know, like let's use Russell as an example. And I, I don't know his exact situation, but let's just say his business was running 100% without him, right? That doesn't mean he just does nothing. He can still go in there and you know what? I might just help some people out. You know, I might just go and train some the odd client for a bit of fun of it. I don't need to. You know, the business is running on its own, but I just want to help people. I like doing it. I want to get a few clients here, you know, or I might come and mentor some of my trainers or I might, you know, go out and do some speaking or some podcasts or, or whatever, you know, it's just a, a good way to build your business or to think about your business. If you're like, Hey, one day I'm going to sell it. Um, my follow-up question, Russell, was there like, was there something that happened that made you think, all right, you know, now's the time I got to build on my business. Did you speak to someone? Was there a scare? Did you see someone else and you got jealous or, or was it just, you know what, I'm doing some thinking and this is what I got to do. Yeah. Look, I think it was just, um, it was just me kind of assessing where I was at in life. Yeah. I, I think that definitely um, when, you know, when I, we had, when Tara and I had our three boys and they started to grow up, I started to realize that, um, you know, being, being, away from early in the morning to late at night, you miss out on a lot. So, you know, it's, 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 it kind of doesn't make sense to have three children and a wife if you're not going to hang out and enjoy yeah. your three children and a wife. Right. Yeah, yeah. So for me, it was like, well, it's a great, it's a great business. What I do, I, I love, but how do I make it so that 
I don't have to be there, you know, from early until late and I can be around my family and do things with them because it's not until you become a parent that you realise um, the the importance of that role, but also how quickly that role um, sort of starts and finishes, you know. So I've already got one son who's at, at university and two others that are nearly 16. In a couple of years' time, they're going to be adults and they're going to be doing their own thing. So you really don't get a long period of time where you can really have a solid impact on the li- on the lives of those people. So, yeah, for me it was... I need to make sure that I'm sort of family man first and business owner second. How do I do that? Love it. I think that's good advice for any, especially the young guys listening, where it's mm. like, as you mentioned earlier, Russell, eh, it's all well and good if you're, you know, 25 to 30, you work all day, all night, doesn't matter too much. But what does it look like in the future? Saying that's important. And I think also just a, a mindset shift. I think if a lot of people are listening to this, they're like, oh, but Russell, I, you know, I, I love training people. I love training people. It's, it's, it's what I like doing, you know. I think you can still sort of spread that message and even further if you have trainers under you. It's like, okay, instead of me training, you know, 25, 30 people on my own, okay, hold on. If I've got two trainers under me and each one of those are using my philosophies to train their 25, 30 people, hold on, I'm giving more of an impact to the to the world than if I was doing it on my own. A- any thoughts on that? Well, yeah, if, you, if you're going to operate a business, you know, you're going to have, I think you need to have an understanding of what your business l- looks like and what's your business philosophy. So, you know, um, my gym, when when Tara and I created our gym, which is Infinity Health Club, we had a picture in mind. What, what was that picture? What did we want it to look like? What did, what did we want it to feel like? What did we want the experience to be? Um how were we going to make an impact on people's lives in a health and fitness? So we had a, a very clear uh, bullet point description of all of those elements, right? Um, so that we, we knew that when someone walked into Infinity Health Club, this is what they got, this is what they experienced, this is what the environment felt like, and, and this is why they would stay. Um, and, and then what you do is you create that and then you, you, you foster that uh, with your staff and with your other trainers. And I guess we collectively know, know that, Jono, as a culture. Mm. You know, every business needs a culture. Um, what do you stand for? Um, and and how, do you, how do you impact people's lives? What's the experience of dealing with me? What's the experience of walking into my gym? What does it look like? What does it feel like? And that's what you try and impart onto your other, your other staff and your other coaches. So that if you're not on the floor, if Jono's not taking the class, it still feels like Jono's taking the class. Wow. That's such a good bit of advice there. And that's that's a whole podcast on its own, right? Building Absolutely. culture there. Well, um, every every business in the world wants to have their own culture. They want mm. to, they should, if they don't, they should, they should stand for something. Mm. You know, what's it feel like? What's it look like? What's the experience like when they walk into that business? Yes. Love it. Well, Hey, I want to be sensitive of your time, Russell. So there's just one more question I want to finish up with. It's probably a three part question though. It's around mentors. So you're obviously a mentor for plenty of people out there that want to get in shape, plenty of trainers as well. I'm curious to hear who your biggest mentors have been throughout the years. If you can answer this in a few different ways, a mentor that you've paid money to and you've done their co- their course or their program or they've coached you, whatever it may be. Uh, a mentor that you haven't paid money to, but maybe they're a friend of yours. Maybe you follow them on social media, whatever it may be. Uh, and then a book that you recommend every fitness professional should read if they want to be a successful fitness professional in Australia. Um, all right. So the, so the three parts. The first question is, um, in terms of payment of, of fees and mentoring, I've probably because I've, I've worked with athletes <clears throat> over a long period of time, um, I've always been closely aligned with the Australian Strength and Conditioning Association okay. because they obviously run level one, level two, level three courses, and I've worked my way up through those levels. Um, so I've always had a fairly close involvement with that organisation because within that organisation, I've found people that I can talk to mm. and learn from and work with. So people like Dan Baker, um, people like Stu Cormack, um, Grant Jenkins, uh, people overseas, um, uh, just trying to think of a few names. Oh, Matt Wenning, 
um, is a guy in America who's very good and other, you know, strength orientated people like that. In terms of mentors that I've, I've kind of just, you know, had contact with and learned from and talked to, I'm lucky in that respect because when you, when you work in an industry for a long period of time, you build up that network. Mm. Um, and so you can pick up the phone and you can ring, you know, for instance, Ian O'Dwyer, who's in mm. Queensland, who does some really amazing stuff around movement um, and, and injury um, rehabilitation and pain reduction. So if I'm stumped in a particular area, which I have been, sometimes I've taken videos of my client training with me and I'll send them to Ian and go, what is going on here? I have no idea. What do you see here? And we've actually worked, you know, one-on-one with a client and he just looks at a video clip for three minutes and goes, oh, you need to do this, 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 and this. And then I come back and I do it with the client. They go, I feel great. I feel, I, I feel so much better. And then I've, I I've obviously neglect to tell them that I've made a phone call. There. <laughs> <laughs> and I take all the credit, right? <laughs> Love it. No. So people like Eno Dwyer, um, obviously Craig Harper, he and he and I talk regularly. Um, so they're probably two guys that, that I, I reach out to from time to time, as well as other colleagues in the strength and conditioning field. Um, and in terms of books, I'm a big book. I'm a big reader of um biographies and autobiographies um i I don't some some business development books i've read sure um the e-myth was one that i I read as a very young person i I really got a lot out of that one but i'm a big i'm a big reader of biographies and i probably take uh other people's life life lessons and probably take learnings from that do do as i do not as i say right anyone can say something but if this person's actually done it, yeah. you know, there's a bit more to it. What's what? What are your top biography or top couple of biographies? Um, I love the sporting ones. There was one yeah. that was uh, I've read. Um, I've got on my desk here. That, uh, what's it called? Total Recall by Arnold oh, Schwarzenegger. Arnold. Yeah, yeah, that's Great a good one. one. Yeah. Um. Oh, also, um, I've I've just finished reading a book on Eddie Maguire. Um, oh. some of the work that he's done. Yeah, so you know things like that are, are always interesting to me. Yeah, I, I just and I, finished. And and for me, Jono, um, sorry to interrupt. Me, yeah, for me, uh, I I've loved the uh, the advent of podcasts because yeah. I do a lot of driving and yeah. I, I have I have really listened to some great stuff over the last three or four years. Mm. So for me, um, I'm I'm big on on finding and uncovering new podcasts and listening to some really good stuff there. Hundred percent. I'll piggyback on both of those. I just finished a biography by, do you know Tyson Fury? You know yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. 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 Just finished that. That was a good biography. So if I'm you want to, you want to check that out. Anyone listening and podcasts? Yeah. When when I started in the industry, um, I did a lot of group fitness and boot camp work. So it was like, okay, driving here to run one boot camp, driving here to run another boot camp, driving there, and I'd spend at least an hour a day driving, you know, and that would yeah. be usually two podcasts. Yeah, and I learned I learned more from just listening to an hour or a podcast a day, two different episodes, than anything else than, than I've ever done. And doing that for you know six months for a year, I listened to mainly business ones. My business acumen went through the roof. Now yep. we're probably speaking to the converted because if someone's watching this, they're already listening to a podcast. Uh, yep. But they can obviously add Russell's podcast to their 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 um, list as well. Well, the um, I, you know Mark Burris has got a really good business podcast. Mm. The mentor that's a great business podcast um if you want to listen if you want to listen to more of a technical podcast i listen to um the strength coach podcast uh okay. also um jay, jay ferugia has a good podcast mm. um yeah there and craig craig harper's podcast is is a good one too the u project for just listening to interesting conversations yeah love it Awesome. All right. Well, hey, Russell, uh, that's pretty much all I wanted to get through today. Is there anything I should have asked you but forgot to or anything you want to finish us off with? No, no, not really. I think I think we've had a good chat. I think the, you know, the industry, just to summarize, the industry is in good shape. But I think that, um, you know, we, we need to we need to make sure that we're continually um, learning good content as opposed to just content. Yeah. I think the young trainers these days, the trap I see for young trainers is 
they're overwhelmed by information that they're, they're almost drowning in information and content and they're not mm-hmm. sure what to use. Or, so some weeks they're coming in and it's all about single leg work. Another week they're coming in and it's all about core work. You know, that they're, they're confused. You, yeah. you need to find... You need to find what works for you. You need to identify and develop your philosophy, your approach. You know, what what do you stand for? And that's going to take some time. So sure, you know, listen to different things, listen to different people, but you got to start to figure out what you stand for and how you're going to actually do your job to get the results for your clients. Yes, love it. Good finish. Awesome. All right. Well, thank you very much for your time, Russell. And for everyone listening, don't forget to subscribe to the Australian Fitness Podcast. I'll put the link in the the show notes. Thanks for your time, Russell. Thanks, Jono.